Welcome to the Disruptor Network Podcast. Welcome back to the Disruptors Network Podcast. And we are back again with another installment of the Growth Project. The Growth Project is going to focus on trying to help people buy homes this year or start investing in real estate or look at real estate as a goal long term or in the short term just to get started, right? So whether you own a home or you're looking to buy more homes, these are the podcasts we're going to try to help you grow. And that's why it's the Growth Project. So welcome back. Ignition. Lift off. We're going to talk this week about what is the right strategy for real estate in 2022? We've gone through two markets two years in a row now that were very, very up with appreciation in the double digits every single year between 20 and 30% of home prices. What that's caused is a higher cost to buy houses, but with interest rates staying low for 2020 and 2021, most people are able to manage the increase in prices. Now we're seeing a, a market and an environment in 2022 where not only is there still a, a housing shortage, which means there's a lack of homes for sale, but now we're in a rising interest rate environment. The Federal Reserve has come out and said they're gonna raise interest rates four times this year. They also have said they're gonna stop buying mortgage-backed securities, and I'll explain what that means for you as a consumer later on or a purchaser. But now we're gonna see an increased cost to mortgages, right, this year. It's gonna cost you more money to borrow, but what I will say is it's not the end, it's not a bad time to buy, because even though rates have gone up, they still are close to historical lows. So it's really, really still cheap to borrow money and it's still a good idea to purchase now. And I'll explain that why also. Um, historically, during the start of a new year, especially over the last three years, with the Fed speaking of raising borrowing rate that we just spoke about, we've seen significant in increases in interest rates. It, so at the beginning of the year for the last three years, at the first quarter or the first month of the year, we saw higher interest rates. The difference is in 2020 and 2021, we were not able to sustain those interest rates going up and they came back down to historic lows. I don't think that's gonna happen this year. I think you're gonna see rates continue to rise over this year back to normal average levels and not buy lows anymore. And when I say normal or average, I think you're gonna see interest rates anywhere between the mid threes, three and a half, to the low fours, between three and a half and 4.25 is probably what you're gonna see for 30 year fixed borrowing rates for you to get money. Again, still very, very cheap money. What I can almost guarantee you this year is that home prices are gonna to continue to rise, right? There's, because there's a lack of homes for sale and a backup of people trying to buy homes, we still have high demand and low supply. So just by the law of averages, you're gonna see an increase of home prices this year. Not at the same levels, but an increase of home prices this year. I think it'll slow down a little bit, but you'll still see them go up. That deficit of homes for sale, so that lack of homes for sale could last another two years. So if you're a buyer looking to get into this market, you're still gonna face some bidding wars. In some situations, in some situations you won't, and I'll explain more of that as well, but you're still gonna be out there in a very competitive market where it's really to the seller's advantage to sell a home right now. Other costs that have, have caused a slowdown in the housing market are material costs. What I mean by that is the cost of lumber, the cost of goods to build a home or fix a home. Those prices were very, very high in 2020 and 2021 because of lack of supply, same reasons, right? I think in that aspect, you will see the supply chain kick back in a little bit with COVID restrictions calming down, and there will be more building. And with that building, the cost of supplies will be a little bit lower. So the, the builders or flippers of those properties will be able to give you a more competitive price point. So I think in that aspect of it, you could see better prices from that standpoint. For new construction or homes that are being flipped, you'll see a lower price point by the end of the year on those uh, in comparison to what you've seen before. So, you know, now what, what to expect and what, what does that mean for you and what you can do, right? So, you know, the expectation because interest rates are going up, historically when interest rates go up, prices come down. That will not happen this year. Interest rates will go up and prices will not come down because of lack of supply like we've spoken about before. So we can't expect to, 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 expect to follow historical trends. It's still a seller's market and it's gonna pretty much can stay, continue to stay a seller's market until we catch up. That catch up, I don't think will come for at least 18 months, possibly up to two years, where we actually have the amount of homes for sale that can meet the demand of buyers. So I think we're still looking at a year and a half to two years of a backup on that. What we are seeing now though, and this is what we didn't see last year, the homes that are overpriced, right? So some sellers are just selling their house because they're like, hey, let me throw a, a heavy price point out there and see if I get it. The homes that are going to market that are way overpriced at, at the time they're listed are not selling. The homes that are competitively priced, meaning that they're priced to what the market is today, you're still seeing lines outside of those houses at the open houses and people trying to make offers on them. For the homes that are overpriced though, they're sitting on the market. So as sellers adjust to that, realizing that they can't overcharge people for the homes anymore, 
those prices will come down. With those prices coming down, it'll slow the appreciation of home values overall. So even though they will be up this year, they won't be as up as much as they've been the last two years. So we will see a slowdown in that. Home sellers need to understand that the days of double digit appreciation are over, right? They have to be more realistic when they price their homes when they come to market. So that's something to, to really look out for. Interest rates are gonna be heavily dependent on what the, the Fed says for the rest of the year, but I think the Fed's kind of made their case clear that of course they're gonna go up. But you know, in general, what you're gonna see with mortgage rates is two things. You're gonna see an increase in them, but you also will see banks willing to make less money on their interest rates to be competitive in the market. So just like anything else, as business slows down, people have to be more competitive to get the business that's out there. So the combination of rates going up, but banks will be willing to make less on those rates will, will give an advantage to the consumer in this market. The problems, if you're a first time home buyer, right, the problem out there is still going to be there's not enough homes for sale to meet the demand. So, you know, you're going to still deal with bidding wars as a first time home buyer. There's a few things that are important when, that, when it comes to that and you have to be cognizant of it at this point. First, the reason you still be, should be searching for a home and you're gonna have to be patient to get through the process is this. Even though rates are up, the only thing you can guarantee yourself, right, is that if you lock in on a mortgage, race, a mortgage rate and lock in on a mortgage payment, you can guarantee your housing costs for the next 30 years unless your taxes and insurance go up, but th that increase will be minimal. The actual bulk of your mortgage payment, which is your principal and interest payment, that's the bulk of your mortgage payment, so the principal that goes right to principal and interest you're paying on top of that, will stay locked in the same for the next 30 years. If you do not lock in on that payment and you continue to rent, rents, I, this I can tell you, I can guarantee, will be at all time highs and, and, and will continue to rise. Rents are not coming down, they're gonna to continue to appreciate. So that's not a fixed housing cost. You may be able to lock in that cost, but only for a year at a time, sometimes two years at a time if you're lucky. So that rent and housing cost will continue to rise, and it's gonna to continue to rise a lot more, and I'm gonna tell you why. Um, it's going to continue to rise more because you have corporate entities like hedge funds and large corp corporations like BlackRock, like Goldman Sachs, like huge Wall Street companies that are coming in and buying up single family homes, not multifamily homes like in the past, but single family homes in bulk. Right, they're buying them in bulk because they see what I'm telling you, that over the next five to 10 years, the single family home rental market will be very, very much in demand, which means they're gonna get a premium for their money. These Wall Street banks are coming in to buy homes in this market because they know they're gonna, that rent's gonna to continue to rise, we're in a state of inflation, so prices are rising in general. On top of that, now rents are going to rise, so they're gonna be able to get a premium for their money. So that's the important thing for you to realize. If you don't lock in on a mortgage rate, and if you don't, don't get a, a, a home, if you don't purchase a home, and you, you back off that process and say you're going to rent, your housing costs will indefinitely increase over the next few years, and I can't guarantee it, but it's as close as the guarantee I can give you that you're gonna pay a lot more in housing costs if you don't lock in on a mortgage. So that's why I still think it's, it's the right time to buy. Um, even though rates are up a little bit, it's still the right time to buy for you. And now in saying that, you have to be patient and looking for a house. It's gonna take a little while. You're gonna go through bidding wars. You're gonna put offers in, they're not gonna get accepted because there's gonna be a lot of people asking for them. You're going to have to compromise on the house you're gonna buy. And that, but the thing I wanna to say to you about that is, if you were ever going to compromise, now's the time to compromise. Now why do I say that? Before 2020, before COVID, the crisis happened, most people were still working in their offices and going to work. Now, the virtual work environment, working from home, digital nomads traveling and working from wherever, is at a greater capacity than even working from office spaces at this point. So if you have the option to work from wherever you want, right, it gives you the option to look in neighborhoods that you wouldn't normally look in because you wanted to be close to, your, to work, you wanted a better commute. You needed schools that were closer to your commute. You can look in other markets now that may be cheaper, cost for you, a cost of living for you than you were able to before because you don't need to be close to your office. So I think you'll, you, as a buyer, you have more options in that way, but it's still a compromise. You not, may not be able to live in the neighborhood that you want to live in exactly. You may not be able to lock in in that house on the perfect block. You're going to have to put some, to put some work into these houses when you move in over time. You're going to have to compromise in a market with a lack of inventory. When there's an abundance of inventory like 2005 and 2006, you were able to get the house you wanted. It was more accessible to get the house you wanted. Now there's less homes for sale, so you're going to have to compromise when you buy. But because there's more options based off of work and school, I think you have more options on where you have to live. And, and that's a good thing. So, you know, because corporate entities, like, I'll just go back to our second, right? Corporate entities are looking into buying more houses. 17% of the new homes that are going to be, uh, are going to be corporate owned. So 17% of the, whole, the homes that these corporations have bought, they're, they're just buying for rent purposes. They're just buying to rent it back to you if you haven't bought yet. We're getting close to a point where, where one in five homes is essentially being taken off the ownership market for rent. 
So that means that one in five homes that are being bought are being bought just to rent back to people who haven't bought yet. So you have to think about that. Do I want to fix the course? Or I want somebody else to fix the course and pay them a premium for the house. And I think that's why it's imperative that you look to buy it now. We're going to see for sure the price of rents increasing for the next few years, not just a year, for the next few years. A lot of these bigger funds that I'm talking about, as they're scooping up homes, they're increasing rent. I'm interpreting their purchasing is that they think they're going to be a very high demand for single family homes in the next few years, right? That's how I'm interpreting it, and that's how you should be interpreting it. I think that you will see many more homes built this year, but I think in general, what you should have to be looking at is you have to be looking at a market where you want to buy, because let's forget about the long-term benefits of real estate, because I still think in a time of crypto, and a volatile stock market, and NFTs, and everything else that's out there for you to invest your money in, Real estate has become the safest investment. Now, do I, do I think that it's gonna be up every single year of year? No, but I don't think that it's possible for us to have a crash again like we had in 2007 and 2008. Whereas the stock market and crypto and NFTs, we don't have enough historical data in this type of market to know what it's going to do. Real estate, as long as we don't see a crash like we saw in 2008, which is impossible, and I'll tell you why, your money is gonna be very, very safe. Now, why do I think we can't have a crash like we had in 2008? In 2008, we had loose credit guidelines, meaning that it was easier to get a home, one. Two, there was an abundance of homes for sale, not a lack of homes for sale, abundance of homes for sale, and people could get financing with as low as a 560 credit score up to 100% financing. So you were buying homes that had no built-in equity in them. So it was, a, it was a perfect storm for a disaster. Now we have stricter credit guidelines, so it's harder for people to qualify, even though you still can qualify most people. It's harder to qualify, though. There's no, there's pretty much no zero down payment loans unless you get a grant or something that's somebody's going you're gonna have to get somebody to put the money down for you but there aren't homes you can buy without down payment unless you're a veteran essentially um, if you're a veteran there are VA loans we can buy with no money down but besides that somebody's gonna either have to help you with the down payment or you're gonna have to put at least three percent down so that's a big difference as well the third difference is again 100 percent financing there's not as many homes for sale homes for sale there's not as much building going on either. They were building huge projects then, so there's an abundance of homes to sell. So as soon as people, as soon as the demand slid, slid a little bit, now these, these homes couldn't be sold. You're not gonna face any of that. So I don't think the crash can happen now like it happened then, which is why, again, I feel like real estate is the safest place you can put your money right now if you're looking at historical data and on something that's gonna make money year over year. If you look back to 1980, Real estate has outperformed the stock market two to one as far as return on investment, right? So two to one, um, even through the crash and everything else. So what does that say to you now when, when the market's at all-time highs and it's volatile where we're having five to 600 point swings a day? It tells you that real estate over the long term and in the present term, I think, is still safer than you're going to look at another market. So that's my two cents. I think that now's as good a time to buy forever. Um, there are plenty of programs out there where you can put 3% down and 3.5% down to get into your home. It's not impossible at all. There's grants out there that get you 0% down payment. On the next uh, podcast, we're going to discuss the programs you can use to get into your home in an inexpensive manner. But this, for the first time being, I think that you have to get um, get with the mortgage owner, get with a realtor, get pre-approved, get out there and start looking at homes because if you want to fix in your, your, your housing costs, now's the best time to still do it. And if you wait longer, prices will rise and interest rates will rise and your payment's going to be higher. So for 2022, the message still is to try to get off the couch now and go out there and start looking for homes or at least start making a plan to buy your first home or a second home as an investment because I think it's the safest place to put your money. This is The Growth Project. We're here to help you try to build your real estate portfolio and just start investing your money in a safe place that can grow for you over time. And Just a quick story to end this podcast with. I bought a home in 2005 in Florida, which was a very, very volatile market. I bought the home pre-construction, meaning that the house wasn't even built yet when I bought it. So I, I, I put money into a home that wasn't built yet. I paid $220,000 for that property. I put a down payment on that property, uh, I believe 10% when I bought it. At the end of the 2008 crash, when the house had just been finished, the house was probably finished for about eight months when the market started crashing in 2007, that property over a year's time went from worth 220 to 70. <laughs> so I lost $150,000 in equity over time. Now, why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you a story, one, because I never think that'll happen again, and two, I was able with real estate to outrun my bad decision to invest in a market that I should have stopped investing in before that. So I was able to, to still gain money on that. Now, let me tell you where that property is present day and then I'll explain my final point. That property present day for me is now paid off. I have no mortgage on it. I have a long-term renter that's been in there for three years. It's an income earning property for me and the value is worth between 275 and 300,000 now depending on what, what, what property you have down there and the market goes this year. So it's appreciated in value, it's an interest earning asset for me, so it's an appreciating asset for me and all I had to do was be able to sustain 
that mortgage payment to be able to last through the problems, right? So uh, what I'm saying to you is that real estate long-term can outrun your ignorance, can outrun your bad decisions, and how, it can outrun a bad investment if you have staying power, and that's why I believe in it. This is The Growth Project. I hope you guys enjoyed it. We'll see you back with the Disruptors Network next time. Our podcast is on all platforms, including Apple, Spotify, uh, Anchor, and it's on our website, so the Disruptors Network and RalphDeWignow.com. See you next time.